This morning, I want to present some thoughts from a, a passage, from a story that is very familiar to all of us that have been going to church at any point in times in our life. And it's a story of Jesus being tempted. It's found in Luke chapter 4. But hopefully this morning, I want us to look at it in a way that's perhaps a little different than what we might look at it. We focus a lot as we study through this story on the temptations themselves and how Jesus was, was tempted. And that's very important, obviously, to get from this particular story. But I want us to look at it as the, some other truths that I think we can gain from this story. Of course, the very first verse of Luke 4, chapter 1, is where it says that Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit. In the end of Luke 3, we see Jesus being baptized and the Holy Spirit in the form or like a dove coming on him. And so that has just occurred. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And so we look at some different things we can learn from this story, some truths from this story that I think we can learn to hopefully help us as well. And one of those truths that we can learn is that we will all have times in the wilderness. We'll all have times in the the wilderness. You know, as I've studied through this story before, as I listened to lessons about this story, as I read through even what it says about Jesus being led into the Spirit, and it, by the Spirit into the wilderness, knowing what's to come, as we're able to look on the story and familiar with the story and know that Satan is going to tempt Jesus as he's in the wilderness, sometimes it's hard for me to comprehend why would Jesus be led to the wilderness to be tempted? That really doesn't make any sense to me if, if he knows or the Spirit knows that's what's going to occur there. But I think there are a couple of reasons for it. One, I think Jesus, to identify particularly with the Jews and the Israelites and to know that he truly was a Jew from the son, a son of David, that just like the Israelites left Egypt and went through the wilderness for 40 years, Jesus himself, as he started his public ministry, went through the wilderness here for 40 days and 40 nights. So there's a connection there for sure. But I think there's also a connection that he's trying to make for all of us. And that is just an acknowledgement of knowing that all of us are going to have times that we spend in the wilderness of life. And so for Jesus to be able to relate, for Jesus to be able to connect with us as our high priest, he too had to have these times in the wilderness so that we can know that he can relate to us as we're dealing with it. We see in Hebrews chapter 2, the Hebrew writer talk about the connections that Jesus makes really with all of us. But in Hebrews 2, verse 17 through 18, the Hebrew writer says, For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and then he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, as he is able to help those who are being tempted. The Hebrew writer talking about Jesus said he had to become fully human. He had to connect and show himself to be human, so he had to have a time in the wilderness because God knew, Jesus knows, there's not a human alive that's been able to spend all of their time on the mountaintops. We've all had to come down on the mountaintop. And we've all had to spend time in the valleys, in the wilderness of life. Later, the Hebrew writer says in chapter 4, verse 15 and 16, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We can approach God, we can approach Jesus with confidence anytime we're in the wilderness of life because we know Jesus himself went through time in the wilderness. He knows what it's like to be isolated. He knows what it's like to be by himself. He understands those things. 
And you see, when we think about having times in the wilderness, it doesn't mean times in the wilderness is just a physical sense. Many of us, perhaps, haven't even really spent any significant time, if any time at all, in what would really and truly be considered a wilderness. The aspect of being in the wilderness is really more of isolation, and times in the wilderness can just be times of isolation. I was talking to my brother-in-law just yesterday who lives out in California, but lives in an area that's truly would be considered wilderness. And as we were talking through and about what's going on in California and their stay-at-home rule they put into effect, he made the comment, I've always felt isolated where we live, and how I feel isolated even more. And that's the sense, times in the wilderness is not just a physical sense, it is a sense of that feeling of isolation, of that feeling of being by yourself, a feeling like no one can relate to you, and no one knows what you're going through. And even when you're maybe surrounded by tens or hundreds or thousands of people, sometimes you can still feel like you're in the wilderness. You can still feel by yourself. We saw that happen even with someone as great as Elijah, if you remember the story. And then with Elijah, after he had that great battle on Mount Carmel and the great victory for God that he orchestrated and helped lead as God instructed him to do so. We know in chapter 19, we see Elijah really get scared as Jezebel wants to go and kill Elijah. And in verse 9 of chapter 19, as he's really running away, it says, it talking about Elijah, that he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. We find out later from God, really, that Elijah is not the only one left that's trying to follow him. But Elijah, at this moment, felt like he was isolated. He was by himself. And times in the wilderness can be the, just that, those times of isolation. And Jesus can relate to that. He can relate to that as he was isolated in the wilderness. Mark lets us know there's nothing but wild animals around him. And angels had to attend to him during this time. And of course, Jesus was isolated really many different times in his ministry, but especially at the cross when almost all really deserted him. So one of the truths we learn from the story is that we will all have times in the wilderness. We all have times of isolation, sometimes unfortunately physically like many of us are doing, dealing with now, but many times often emotionally as well. Another truth we learn from the story is that Satan looks to attack us during our times in the wilderness. Now, don't misunderstand me. Satan is always trying to attack us. He's always trying to attack God's people. We don't have to be in the wilderness of life for that to occur. He can attack us at any time. But especially it's when we are in the wilderness season of life, when we are in isolation, that Satan looks to really try to take advantage of us when we're at that weakest moment and attack us. We see again back in Luke chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, or the first part of verse 2, where Luke tells us, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. A lot of times we read this passage in Luke 4 and think Jesus just had three temptations. That's not the case. Jesus was tempted throughout these 40 days. And by the way, he was tempted throughout his life and particularly his public ministry. But we have recorded three temptations that perhaps summarize the temptations that Satan was given to Jesus and gives to us. But Satan knew and recognized this was an opportunity, perhaps, to tempt Jesus. Because he was in a vulnerable spot, he was isolated, he was weak physically. And perhaps as he was weak physically, that led him to being weak emotionally as well. We see it happen really with the Israelites when they went through the wilderness. Part of our reading recently is Numbers 21, 
when it says they traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread. There is no water. And we detest this miserable food. The Living Translation records it as saying, they actually say it, we hate this manna. They're going through the wilderness and, and what's helping them survive, they're complaining about. And they're saying God's not taking care of them. As you read through the story, we know God got angry with them, really. And this is the text in which God sent poisonous snakes on them. And ultimately, when he, God gave salvation to them by having Moses hold up, basically what amounted to a snake. But so we see it happen to the Israelites that Satan then really attacks them and causes them to grumble, to complain during their time in the wilderness. It's part of the reason why Paul says in Ephesians 4, when he says, In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while, while you're still angry. Well, why, Paul? In verse 27 he says, And do not give the devil a foothold. Satan knows that if we leave, when we are ourselves in a very spot where Satan can attack us, when we're angry, for instance, we leave ourselves open to Satan's attacks because we're weak. And when we go through these times of wilderness in our life, when we go through the times of isolation, when times aren't good, that's when Satan oftentimes can attack us. And we need to and we must be on the lookout for that. A third truth we learn from this story is we must be careful to not test God. We must be careful not to test God when you look at the temptations that are recorded for us, both in Matthew and Luke, the three temptations that we have, each of the temptations, in some ways, you can make a case that Satan is trying to get Jesus to test God, to show a distrust toward God. He knows Jesus is hungry and says, Hey, why don't you tell these stones to become bread? Satan really knows that Jesus has the ability to do that. But it's almost like Satan is saying, are you sure God's taking care of you? Are you sure you are who you claim to be? Why don't you test him? Apparently he's not taking care of you. He's not giving you food. And of course Jesus responds by saying, man does not live on bread alone. Following what God says is much more important than doing what Satan says. And then he says, look, you see everything, all these kingdoms of the world, Satan offers to give them to Jesus. He really offers to make him prince of the world because Satan himself is. Satan says, just bow down and worship me. And Jesus says, no, that's not part of God's plan. Satan's saying, test God on this. And he said, no, I trust God. I know that's not part of his plan. Yes, my kingdom is not of this world. But it's when I get to the cross and defeat Satan once and for all that I'll bow at Jesus. And then we see in verse 9, as Luke records the third temptation on Luke's account, it says, The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. There's really a principle, a couple of different places in Scripture about putting God to the test. It happens with what Peter says to Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. And in 1 Corinthians, it talks about the Israelites putting God to the test as they are going through the wilderness Satan Jesus knew that Satan was trying to get him to put God to the test almost trying to back God into a corner because Satan knew that if Jesus threw himself down Satan quoted scripture as saying that God would take care of him because he's the Messiah he would not let him be hurt but Jesus said don't put him to the test don't put God to the test sometimes if we're not careful we do that 
to God. I think about the story, I know I've shared it before, it's a very familiar story, kind of older story that's been passed around, I know, a lot. But it's a story of a man that really lived by himself, it was a faithful man trusting God, and where he lived there was flood that was coming and waters that were starting to rise, and he prayed to God about God taking care of him and protecting him. Well, a knock comes on the door, and it's really a police car that comes by and says, Sir, we got to get you out of here. A flood's coming. you got to leave. And the, and the guy says, No, I'm not going to go. I, I trust God. I know he's going to protect me from this. I'm staying. And the next thing happens, and waters start to rise, and a boat comes along, and men in the boat, and they see he knows this guy's in the house. He says, Come on, you've got to get out of here. The water's rising. And the man says, No, I, I know God's going to take care of me. I'm staying. When the waters begin to rise and the man actually has to climb to the roof of his house and the helicopter comes in, wants to throw down a ladder and says, come on, we got to get you out of here, got to get you safe. And the man says, no, God's going to take care of me. I know that's going to be the case. So the helicopter flies away. When well, the waters continue to rise and the man ultimately drowns, he does go to heaven and when he gets to heaven, he, he looks at God and says, God, what happened? I trusted you. I know you've always said you're going to take care of us and protect us. I, I trusted you that you're going to do that for me. What happened? And God said, well, I sent you a car and a boat and a helicopter. Sometimes if we're not careful, we can be like that man. We can test God. That's why I love what John Mark Hicks said this past week when he said, trusting God and wisdom are not mutually exclusive. God gives us wisdom, and we must make sure that we're careful not to test God during this time. So three truths we see from the story, that we will all have times in the wilderness. But as we are in the wilderness, Satan looks to attack us, and we must be ready for that. And we must be careful to not test God. Well, how do we handle our times in the wilderness Jesus shows us this too. And one of the ways we can handle this time is we must walk with the Spirit. There's something that I noticed that I'm sure I've read before, but I hadn't really paid much attention to it until I was getting ready for this lesson. We've already read in verse 1 of Luke 4, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. But then in verse 14 of Luke 4, the very next verse after the story of the temptations, it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Jesus was full of the Spirit when he went into the wilderness. Jesus was full of the Spirit when he left the wilderness. We must make sure that we stay in step with the Spirit. We must walk with the Spirit, even as we're going through our times in the wilderness. Galatians 5 talks about this. It says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say... Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Paul acknowledges here in Galatians 5 that the Spirit and our human nature are in conflict with each other, wanting different things, different desires. And the question is, which one are we going to walk with? And if we walk with the Spirit, the Spirit has the power to always help us to not gratify the desires of of the flesh, to not give in to the temptations of Satan. So we must walk with the Spirit. And then as we go through our time in the wilderness, we must walk with the Word. We must walk with the Word. Again, back in Luke 4, we, you've heard it a number of times in lessons about this story. But how did Jesus respond to every temptation? He responds with Scripture. Verse 4 of Luke 4, Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. Verse 8 of Luke 4, Jesus answered, it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. 
Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. In verse 12, Each time Jesus answered Satan with Scripture, and we must walk with the Word. When Paul talks about the armor of God, he says the Word of God is a sword of the Spirit. The Word of God is how the Spirit really battles against Satan. And so we must walk with the Word as Satan attacks us because it's in the Word that we can always find answers to the temptations that Satan gives us. And that's why I encourage you and challenge you that even in these times, make sure you're spending time in the Word. Make sure you're keeping up with our daily readings. Spend more focused time, meditation time with the Word. The times of wilderness are not easy. Not just in this time that we're dealing with, this season that we're dealing with, the, the virus that's going around that's causing so much isolation. But any time we face the wilderness, it's important we walk with the Word as we walk with the Spirit. I hope and challenge you to make sure that as we go through our times in the wilderness that we're all battling right now, we remember to make sure that we stay in step with God through Jesus, through the Spirit, and doing so through His Word.